All right, if we could uh, if we could get started here. We're continuing our look at uh, Judah and the many indictments against Judah, the judgment against Judah. Uh, but bef- before we go into our uh, next memory verse, which I changed, sorry if you guys already memorized uh, Isaiah 6 and verse, I think, 8, but uh, it's going to be Isaiah 5.20 now, just for, just for a few Wednesdays. I thought that would fit in with what we're uh, talking about now. Uh, and it's not, a, it's not a hard verse to memorize. But before we get into that, uh, some review questions. Um, multiple choice. Actually, I think instead of multiple choice, it, just, it should be just check all that apply, okay? The covenant made God, uh, God made with Abraham was bec- between God and whom? A, Abraham, B, his seed in their generations, C, obedient individuals, or D, all of the above? A, B, C, and D. <laughs> I'm going to go with Abraham, his seed in their generations. The covenant God made with Abraham. Let's look at that. Genesis 17. Genesis. I mean, was, what was the covenant God made with Abraham for? What was it for? Was it for salvation? No, it wasn't, was it? It's all it's all about preserving the seed line to Christ, right? So seventeen, uh, verses seven through fourteen, I will establish my covenant between me and thee and thy seed after thee in their generations, right? Uh, uh, for an everlasting covenant to be a God unto thee and to thy seed after thee, and I will give it unto thee and to thy seed after thee, the land wherein thou art a stranger. Now, there is a caveat. You could say obedient individuals if you're looking at it from the standpoint of who are Abraham's seed. What's that? Obedient individuals. So, I guess I have to give you credit there. What, what I was going there, what, what I was going with was uh, the, that, that covenant itself was not for salvation, was it? No. Today, what must happen before one can say they are in a covenant relationship with God? We're looking at Isaiah 2.3. They must be taught His ways, another way of saying here, right? And they must walk in His paths, another way of saying believe and obey, right? So, uh, remember bringing these up, this, this up because we were talking about Jeremiah 2 uh, and, and uh, verse 3 where he says, He will teach us of His ways. And we will walk in his paths. That's looking forward. And you can cross-reference with uh, Jeremiah 31, 31 through 34. They shall no more uh, say uh, one man unto his neighbor, uh, know ye God, for they shall all know God. Now, why is that? It's because they knew him before they entered that covenant. So that's where we were, why I chose these for the review questions. Our three points last class were that all nations flow into the house of God because it 
is openly inviting. It's a taught religion, and it consists of the willingly obedient. So I know we skipped a Wednesday, so that I gave you the answers there. We'll go forward to uh, Isaiah chapter 5, 20. This will be the memory work. Pretty easy. I think we could, if I just threw in blanks up there already, I'm, I'm pretty confident most of us would get it, right? Because we've heard this over and over. It's very ap- applicable uh, to today. Woe unto them that call evil good and good evil, that put darkness for light and light for darkness, that put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. We're all familiar with that verse, right? And we're familiar with what it looks like, aren't we? We just have to look around us and, and we see what this looks like. Um, let me ask you, if we go back to creation week, before creation week, and we, we see that the earth is without form and void, Right? And there's nothing but darkness. And God, on on day one, he says, let there be light. And what does he say about that light? How does he describe that? And and the Lord saw that it was good, right? And then we have day two. Uh, on, On the second day, Let's, let's go ahead and look at Genesis real quick. And let's just look at how many times we see, and, and God saw, and it was good. God said, um, let there be a firmament, starting in verse 6, in the midst of the waters, and let it divide the waters from the waters. So we have here... Uh, God dividing the deep, the, the waters, and you have a firmament and above, which, uh, it, wherein are the waters. You have the waters below, and, uh, and God called the firmament heaven, and the evening and the morning were the second day. We move on to the third day. God said, let the waters under the heaven be gathered together, what? and he brought up dry land, right? And what comes after the dry land? Plants all manner of plants and, and, and things that spring from seeds. And God looks at it and in uh, verse 12. What does he say? Or he saw it and, and saw that it was good, right? And the fourth day, let there be lights in the firmament of, of the heaven to divide the day from the night and let them be for signs and for seasons, for days and for years. And so to sum all this up, he's putting together the stars in the sky that we see. Seeing all the plant, we see the planets, we see the sun and the moon, all of these things with their perfect uh, order, the gravitational forces that each of them has, the orbits that each of them has, uh, creating this perfect uh, measurement of time in in the night sky that we we can see, and well, during the day as well with with the sun and the moon. And so, what's he say in verse 18? And to rule over the day and over the night and to divide the light from the darkness, God saw that it was what? Good. It was good. The fifth day, uh, starting in verse 20, And God said, Let the waters bring forth abundantly the moving creature that hath life and fowl that may fly above the earth in the open firmament of heaven. He's creating sea creatures. He's creating fish. He's creating fowl. And we see, um, looking at verse 21, that God saw that it was good. Once again, it's good. Uh, In the sixth day, God said, Let the earth bring forth living creature after his kind, cattle and creeping thing, the beast of the earth after his kind. And it was so. God made the beast of the earth after his kind, and the cattle after their kind, and everything that creepeth upon the earth after his kind. God saw that it was what? It was good. And then God makes man. God makes Adam. And... uh, we know just looking at, at chapter 2, what occurs there, how that Adam was uh, in the garden. He was made to till and work the garden. Uh, Jeff Miller, uh, I really enjoyed what he had to say about uh, this, this part of the, well, I enjoyed the whole thing, but this part um, I, I really enjoyed, how that uh, God was naming all these animals. Um, he, was, he was there, in, uh, Adam, rather, and uh, he's alone, isn't he? And God looks at that and, and he says what? It's not good.
good. It's not good that man should be alone. And, and he does what? He creates woman. Uh, he creates uh, a help meet for Adam. Uh, uh, someone that is worthy or is um, a help that is, uh, I'm trying to put, paraphrase, help me. A help that is, um, what's another translation say there? Anyways, a help that is compatible. There we go. A help that is compatible for, uh, for Adam. Uh, none of the animals could have provided it. And uh, obviously, another man could not have provided it, uh, but, another, but a woman. And so after she's created, uh, moving back to chapter, chapter 1 there. Uh, let's see. Creation of man here. In verse 27, so God created man in his own image, and the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. And, uh, and God blessed them, and God said unto them, Be fruitful, and multiply, and replenish the earth, and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over ev every living thing that moveth upon the earth. And God said, Behold, I have given you every herb bearing seed, which is upon the face of the earth, and every tree, which is the fruit of a tree yielding sealed, seed, uh, to you it shall be for meat. And let's just skip down to verse 31. God saw everything he had made, and behold, it was what? Very good. It was very good. So it's good, good, let me count them. Good, 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 not good, and then very good, right? So, what am I getting at here? God, the creator of all the universe, not just the universe, but the reality in which the universe sits, all of natural law, the creator is defining what is good and what is not good. And when you have created somehow a universe or a system of natural laws uh, that, uh, you know, somehow it's outside of this universe and you've created a, a universe and a reality with uh, natural laws that that universe has to adhere to, then you can decide what's good, right? But we can't do that, can we? God can do that. God did that. God says what's good and what's not good. But what does man do? Man says, he calls evil good, and good evil. And uh, that's how we end up with, you know, the society around us looks at the uh, homosexuality and says, you know, love is love, just be tolerant of it. Uh, it's good, it's love, right? Woe unto them that call evil good and good evil, that put darkness for light and light for darkness and bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Uh, one could say, you know, you're not being very tolerant of others by, by teaching this narrow-minded truth that, that, you know, everybody's, everybody has to follow Jesus. What, what about the Muslims? What about, what about all these other religions? Well, that's calling evil good, right? Or good evil, rather. Uh, calling us out for our service to God and saying uh, that it, it is evil. Woe to them that call evil good and good evil. Put darkness for light, light for darkness, that put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. And notice how those things are pretty obvious. You're not going to mistake darkness for light, nor, nor are you going to mis mistake light for darkness, right? Uh, it's pretty obvious. And yet, it's also obvious that a man is a man and a woman is a woman. It, it's, all, it's also obvious that two men cannot have offspring. So the very basis, uh, or the very, the most elementary thing you can look at to say homosexually, homosexuality is not good according to natural law. It's like bitter for sweet. If it makes you pucker, then it's probably not sweet, right? Uh, if, if you can't see, if you're stumbling around in the dark, 
It's probably, there's probably not a light on in the room, right? It's, it's obvious, and yet man still does it. And so, th- we're going to get to this verse when we, uh, we discuss the woes against Judah. And this is something that they were doing. They were, there were men uh, that called g- evil good and good evil. There have always been men that did that. Uh, it's, it's still true today. Any comments or questions? Mm-hmm. Absolutely. God's the one that makes the standards. There's, there's no, uh, and we talked a lot about this in the, uh, in the logic in the Bible class that, um, that it's uh, it. Truth is very black and white. It's either true or it's not. Uh, and, and God is the one that has defined that for us. We're, uh, in uh, Micah chapter 6 and verse 8, Micah says, He hath showed thee, O man, what is good, and what doth the Lord require of thee but to do justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with thy God. He showed us. He showed us. He showed mankind what is good and who are we to say otherwise? Who are we to call good evil and e- uh, evil good? So we're going to continue here looking at the uh, grounds for judgment, uh, further indictments against Judah. And I kind of, uh, what I plan to do is go through these indictments and we'll back up. I was going, that uh, the song of the vineyard was going to be one of these things I backed up and talked about. So we've got that. Uh, we've got that um, gone through that, I guess, and we'll we'll come back and we'll talk about chapter six about the vision that Isaiah did, and we'll have numerous things we'll come back to. But for right now, we're going to talk about the defendants, the indictments, and the sentencing uh, as far as uh, chapters two through ten go. So, um, first of all, the we've seen some indictments before we discussed. Um, the uh, passage of hope in Isaiah 2, 2 through 5, which we have gone through. Uh, here the prophet continues uh, relaying the uh, message of judgment against Judah and Jerusalem. And we'll want to remember uh, that there was hope because the state of their current nation, uh, as Judah as it was, as, as Isaiah is describing, is not permanent. We, all we have to do is look uh, uh, to chapters, uh, I believe it's in chapter 10, uh, where we see some hope there. Um, but the ultimate hope is what? The nation to come, the church, uh, as we read in Isaiah 2, uh, 2 through 5, that, uh, that it shall come to pass in the last days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the hills and shall be exalted above the uh, established in the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills and all nations shall flow into it. Uh, and many people will go and say, come ye and let us go up into the mountain of the Lord to the house of the God of Jacob. He will teach us of his ways and we will walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law and out of uh, and the word of Jerusalem and the word from Jerusalem, the word of God from Jerusalem. Messed it up, I'm sorry. But and at any rate, the church is coming, right? It's good news. The, the method of salvation for Judah is coming. So in the midst of all these indictments, uh, there's hope. So what does God hate? Let me ask you that. What does God hate? Sin, yep. Uh, did he hate sin in the Old Testament? Did he define sin in the Old Testament? Yeah, he did. Uh, does he still hate it today? Yeah. 
So God doesn't change. We know that from Malachi 3.6, uh, Hebrews 13.8. Uh, was he okay with fornication uh, during, during the days of Isaiah? Was he, was he okay with adultery or injustice? Uh, idolatry? No. So he's not okay with any of that today either, right? So we have many common things in common with those in 8th century uh, B.C. Judah. Uh, for, for instance, the world around us is chaotic, relatively. I say relatively a lot tonight, because we are relatively prosperous, and yet relatively not as prosperous as maybe we were uh, years ago. Uh, but the world around us is also chaotic. All we get, look at it, uh, Israel right now, what's happening over there in, uh, concerning Iran and all that. The uh, world around us is chaotic. Uh, but it's also chaotic because the world around us is turned to idols. Uh, we're also in a period of relative prosperity, uh, which could collapse at any moment because our currency, let's face it, it's not based on anything. It's, uh, we know what fiat is, right? What fiat money is? Fiat money is the government says this piece of paper has value. And then the more they print, the less valuable it is. But uh, it's not based on anything. So it's, uh, there's an ounce of chaos, chaos there as well. Uh, Judah is in a period of prosperity, and they're going to lose it all soon. Uh, we know from you know, hindsight's 2020. Uh, so a, a period of material prosperity uh, has bred complacency with Judah. Does that sound familiar? Yeah, complacency. Uh, and those that are supposed to be representing Jehovah are instead influenced by uh, this world. They're influenced by the idols of Assyria and all those East, Eastern nations. Same thing's happening today. Are people not putting things before God? Are people within the church not putting things before God as well? Still happening today. So the important similarities, uh, though, is uh, we confront the same problem of sin, and we need to resist and repent it, first of all. Second of all, we have the same remedy in Jesus' blood, a, a dwelling place in that house of the Lord, established in the top of the mountains and exalted above the hills. And finally, there's a small remnant of people. We have that in common with Judah. A small remnant of people that are faithful to God that might provide hope to those that are not faithful to God. So in a courtroom, uh, you typically have witnesses, you have evidences uh, presented to support indictments. We know charges, in other words, uh, against a defendant. And then you have a verdict and a sentencing. Now, who did Isaiah call to witness? That's a review question. I, Isaiah chapter 1, verse 2. Who, who did Isaiah call to witness? Judah? The heavens and the earth, he says, Isaiah 1 and verse 2. And so what are the indictments and the sentences here? First of all, the uh, defendants, though. Let's uh, read uh, Isaiah. Somebody, somebody could get Isaiah. I'm going to go farther than 8 and 9 here. Could I have somebody read uh, Isaiah chapter 2, verses 8 through 12. All right, thank you, brother. So first of all, verses 8 and 9, <clears throat> we see the mean man, which doesn't mean a, a guy that's not very nice. It means 
What does the word mean also mean? Average, right? It means average in, in mathematical terms. So we, we're talking about the average Joe here in verses 8 and, and 9. So the average person as well as the high class is subject to Jehovah. Uh, and we have social movements these days. Uh, this day and age, they tend to excuse those. You know, this guy stole. He's he's uh, he's just trying to feed his family. You know, they'll make excuses. Um, they're products of their environment. They, they're not. It's not their fault. Uh, they're just poor. They uh, there's excuses made when you're in a lower class today. Uh, but Judah. Judah here is experiencing a period of prosperity, uh, but there's still a high and a lower class, and the lower class back in that time was probably a lot less fun place to be than it is today. We're relatively uh, prosperous today to where the poorest among us in this nation are richer than most of the rest of the world. That's, that's just a fact. But uh, God, through Isaiah, is... Uh, Referring to the average Joe here in verses 8 and 9. The, uh, the mean man boweth down. He's bowing down to these idols. And not just the mean man, but the great man. The, the, uh, the great man and the lofty there in verses 9 through uh, 12 here. Um, so the overlying me uh, theme of the minor prophets. Anybody remember that? What's the, ver what's the verse? a review question. I'll make it a review question next week. Yeah. Sean's God. He's just letting somebody else answer it. <laughs> Proverb 14.34 Righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. Right? Righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. A physical nation is made up of many people of many different classes. And uh, righteousness, when it's valued, when it's striven for uh, by the majority within a nation, is going to bring about a tremendous blessing uh, for that nation. If the higher class or the uh, leadership of a people behaves corruptly and uh, takes advantage of those with less, is self-serving and deceitful, it's not sustainable. It's not good for anybody in the long run. If the higher class is corrupt and and is mistreating the lower class, right? And is that, does that sound like righteousness if a higher class does that? No. And that's actually describing Judah, we'll find out, um, that their higher class is doing this. If the lower class reacts to this treatment with rebellion and anarchy, uh, we find they, is that a characteristic of righteousness? If you behave toward the, the higher-ups with uh, rebellion and anarchy? Romans 13, or be subject to the higher powers, right? Uh, and so that's not characteristic of a nation. So uh, to seek righteousness is to seek exaltation, or looking at Proverbs 14, 34. So the average person in that day was bowing the knee to idols. And, uh, you know, who knows why? Maybe the prosperity doctrine got to them. Uh, there... There were all kinds of reasons that people would worship idols back then. They would worship them because they thought that uh, it would bring them prosperity. Maybe you're more fertility-minded, and you'll worship idols that are fertility gods, hoping to have fertility, lots of children, or maybe lots of uh, uh, produce, even. Uh, there are several different reasons to, that people worshipped idols back then. All of the same drives and temptations of man are common motivations for all kinds of classes of people. Hunger is a motivation. Um, sex is a motivation. Pride is a motivation. Power. All of that. And all of that was uh, purportedly available through idol worship back in the day. And it still is today, isn't it? Uh, if you pour all your time into your job, if you pour all your time into the pursuit of monetary gain, that's, that's your idol today. If you put it all into recreation, it's your idol. Um, and so we, we understand that. So the, 
everyone has something they can put in front of God, poor and rich alike. So the average Joe, the great man, and the lofty God, God is calling them and indicting them. Uh, then you have the lofty dependent. Let's look at uh, Isaiah 2 and verse 22. Or let's look, start in verse 9. Did the second bell ring? It did? Or no? The answer was no, it didn't, and now it did. So I thank you all for your attention. We're going to look at the rest of the defendants uh, in, in this courtroom. You have the lofty dependent. You have the women. Then you just have the general people. We'll then discuss the indictment. So uh, does anybody have any comments or questions before we leave? Well, thank you all for your attention.